Summary of Life in the Iron Mills by Rebecca Harding Davis Life in the Iron Mills starts with an account of an unknown industrialized town in the American South whose main product is iron. The story is told by an unnamed person who lives in the town. The narrator sits at a window and looks out over the town. He or she sees drunk workers smoking tobacco, a dirty river moving slowly along its path, and people walking to or from work in the mills. As the storyteller watches the world go by through the window, he or she thinks of a story that happened in this town. The narrator knows that the reader might be skeptical about how important it is to hear about a worker whose life was boring, just like the lives of thousands of other workers. But this story has a dangerous secret that has caused people to go crazy or even kill themselves. This secret can only be found if the reader listens to the narrator's story with an open mind and no preconceived ideas about what kinds of people and places are good for writing about. The reader has to follow the storyteller down into the dirty city to meet Hugh Wolf, a Welsh immigrant who works at Kirby and John's Iron Mill as a furnace helper. Hugh used to live in the house where the storyteller now lives. That was 30 years ago. Six people rented the single house at the time, but Hugh, Hugh's father, and their cousin Deborah rented the two basement rooms. The story of the wolf starts when the point of view changes from first to third person. A cotton picker named Deborah gets home from work on a stormy night to a small, dark, and mossy basement room. Hugh's father, a small, weak man, is sleeping on some straw in the corner while Deborah quietly makes dinner. Deborah is pale and looks a little sick, and she has a bit of a hunchback. She does not drink booze like her friends do. The narrator thinks that she must have something else in her life that keeps her going, like a dream or love that is far away. The narrator thinks that when that thing is gone, she will probably drink whiskey like everyone else. As she eats, she hears a quiet sound and sees that Janie, a young Irish girl from the neighborhood, is hiding in the old clothes on the floor. Janie says that she is sleeping at the wolf's house tonight because her dad is in jail. She says that Hugh works at the mill during the night shift. Right away, Deborah gets up and starts putting together a meal for Hugh, which includes a glass of ale for herself. Deborah brings Hugh's dinner to the mill, even though it's almost midnight, it's pitch black, and it's raining. She does this almost every night, even though Hugh rarely thanks her. She thinks about how the mill looks like it belongs in hell, with its roaring fires and shadowy forms of half-dressed men. When they get to the mill, Hugh eats his food and tells Deborah to lie down on the pile of ash to rest and warm up. The storyteller keeps coming back to the picture of Deborah lying in the bed of ash, too tired, too cold, and in too much pain to move. The narrator asks the reader to look more closely at Deborah and see not only how dirty and sad she is, but also how selfless she is, how jealous she is, and how much she loves Hugh. The narrator says that her face looks dead because she has loved Hugh for years but he has never loved her back. She also knows that Hugh is kind to her because he is kind to everyone, even the rats in the cellar. Deborah sees that Hugh wants to be beautiful, and she thinks that's why he's turned off by her disability and drawn to Janie. The narrator tells the reader that these feelings of sadness and jealousy are shared by everyone. The storyteller gives a short description of Hugh and says that the other iron workers think he is strange and too girly. Hugh is sick with tuberculosis. His skin is yellow and his muscles are weak. He doesn't drink or fight as often as the other guys, and when he does, he gets badly beat up. He also has a strange hobby of making figures out of coral, which is a waste product of making iron. He spends months working on each statue, only to destroy it when he's done. As the story goes on, the narrator asks the reader not to judge Hugh too quickly, since his personality and decisions are the result of a lifetime of hard work, years of illness, and overwhelming feelings of despair, dissatisfaction, and pain. A small group of tourists come back to the mill. Hugh knows some of the men, like the foreman, Kirby, who is the son of one of the mill owners, and Dr. May, who is a doctor in the area. A man who works for a newspaper and another guy are among them. The guys talk about money and politics, and one of them says that the mill looks a lot like Dante's Inferno. Kirby, Dr. May, and the other stranger, whose name is Mitchell, 
stay behind to wait out the rain after the reporter goes. When the guys finally leave, they are shocked to see a huge figure of a woman made out of coral that looks just like her. Mitchell thinks that Hugh is the artist, and Dr. May asks Hugh what the figure means to him. Hugh says that the woman is hungry for life. Dr. May doesn't understand this answer, but Mitchell gets it. Kirby says the figure is silly and that he doesn't care about his workers' artistic skills. In fact, none of society's problems are his responsibility. All he has to do is pay his employees on time. Dr. May wants to cheer Hugh up, so she tells him that he has a lot of promise. Hugh asks Dr. May for help, but May quickly says he can't because he doesn't have enough money and helping one person is pointless if he can't help everyone. Kirby, Dr. May, and Mitchell are waiting for the coach while Mitchell says that change should come from within, not from outside help. Hugh feels like he's not good enough and angry after the three guys leave. When they get home, Deborah tells Hugh that the people they met at the mill said that money was the only thing that could save them. Deborah, who is getting more and more crazy, shoves a big wad of money that she stole from Mitchell into his hands. Hugh just asks if this is what life has come to. Deborah tells Hugh the next day that he has the right to keep the money. He thinks about this for a whole day before deciding to keep the money. As he walks through the town, he thinks about all the things he will miss and knows that he is about to start a new life. He walks into a church by accident. He likes the preacher's fancy language, but he thinks the talk is for rich people and not for him. The storyteller jumps in and says that Hugh was found guilty of stealing by morning. When Dr. May reads about Hugh's conviction in the newspaper, he gets angry and tells his wife that Hugh wasn't thankful for all the help Dr. May gave him. Haley, the jailer, says that Hugh's term of 19 years is the worst punishment that the law allows. Haley also says that Mitchell, the guy Hugh stole from, went to see Hugh in jail the next day because he was interested. Hugh has been quiet and sicker since then, but he still tries to get away every time he can. Deborah, who helped Hugh, is only in jail for three years. Haley says that every day she begs him to let her see Hugh, and Haley finally gives in. When Haley lets Deborah into Hugh's cell, Deborah knows right away that Hugh is sick and going crazy. Deborah tells Hugh she loves him while she is crying. He doesn't pay attention to her because he is too interested in scraping a piece of tin across the bars. Hugh is dying, and Deborah can tell by looking at his face. Hugh can tell that his time on Earth is almost over because he can hear the sounds of the market from his window. When Haley comes to take Deborah back to her cell, she tells Hugh that she knows he will never see her again. Hugh agrees, and he tells her to tell his dad and Janie goodbye for him. Later that night, Hugh kills himself by cutting his arms with the pointy piece of tin. Deborah can tell what's going on from her cell, and she keeps telling herself that Hugh knows best. The next day, a lot of people, like an examiner, reporters, and Kirby, come to Hugh's cell. Later, a Quaker woman comes to Hugh's body to care for it. Deborah begs the woman to bury Hugh in the country so that he doesn't have to stay buried in mud and ash in the city. The Quaker woman says that she lives in the country and that Hugh will be buried there the next day. She also says that after Deborah has finished her three-year sentence, she will come back to get her and take her to the country. The narrator says that three years later, the Quaker woman was true to her word, and that Deborah has become the most calm, humble, and loving person of all the Quakers because of nature and Christian love. The storyteller also says that Deborah still loves Hugh. The narrator says that the coral figure, which is now kept in the narrator's library behind a curtain, is the only sign that Hugh ever lived. Some of the things the statue asks are, is this the end? Nothing beyond? No more? A tiny bit of light shines into the room and hits the figure. The storyteller says that the statue's arm seems to point to the east, where God will make the sun rise again. About the author. Rebecca Harding Davis was born in Pennsylvania in 1831, but she spent most of her life in Wheeling, Virginia, which is now in West Virginia. The unnamed town in her book Life in the Iron Mills is based on Wheeling. Davis read a lot and was the top student at her Pennsylvania female high school, where she finished as the top student in 1848. 
She is one of the people who started American literary realism. She had a long and successful writing career as a novelist, journalist, and editor. Life in the Iron Mills, her first finished piece, was a big hit as soon as it came out in April 1861 in the very prestigious Atlantic Monthly. Even though the story was first released under an alias, Davis was still known as the author, and famous writers like Nathaniel Hawthorne and Emily Dickinson paid attention to it. Rebecca Harding Davis wrote more than 500 published works in her career, including 10 books, over 100 short stories, and many pieces of journalism. However, she was never able to reach the same level of success as life in the Iron Mills. Her work is mostly about how men and women relate to each other, social justice, poverty, and the Civil War. She got married to a writer named L. Clark Davis in 1863, and one of their children also became a journalist. She died in 1910, six years after completing Bits of Gossip. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.